Well, good morning. For those of you who tuned in here this morning to check out uh, our live stream feed on the prairie chickens here at Dunn Ranch, I'm Kent Wamsley, and I am co-hosted this morning with Steve Buback with MDC. Uh, look forward to just talking prairie chickens and seeing the live cam that we have out here on site. So I do want to give you a little bit of uh, kind of housekeeping things here this morning. So what you will need to do is we are not going to be opening up mics where people can actually talk. But if you can look in the chat box or in the Q&A area, uh, please drop any questions that you may have there. And as we proceed through this morning, we will end up and make sure to answer as many of those questions as we possibly can. So thank you for joining us. Uh, like I said, uh, my name is, is Kent Wamsley. I work for the Missouri Department or the Missouri chapter, the Nature Conservancy. And I have been here in Missouri a couple of years and I am housed out of Dunn Ranch. And I am the Grasslands and Sustainable Ag Strategy Manager for our chapter. Uh, some of that work takes me into uh, Iowa as we will be talking about as the presentation goes on because I do operate within not just the Grand River Grasslands where Dunn Ranch is located, but also within the greater context of Missouri. And along with me is Steve. I'll let him kind of give an intro on himself. Right, thank you, Kent. So my name is Steve Bubeck. I'm a natural history biologist with the Missouri Department of Conservation. Uh, what that means is I work with um, basically rare plants, animals, and communities throughout Northwest Missouri. So there's uh, it's kind of a rare position. There's eight of us in the state, and we deal with all manner of things from birds and bugs to butterflies. And so we get a wide variety of things. And one of the things I'm fortunate enough to work with is the state endangered greater prairie chicken, which uh, hopefully you all have heard some about because that's why we're here today. So um, I've been in the department for 10 years now. Uh, prior to that, I worked for Forest Park in St. Louis and uh, kind of moved around the country for a while, but Missouri is my home and I'm glad to be back. Uh, so Kent much take us into the intro of uh, Tell us where we are in the world. <laughs> so right now this morning, if I was to open up my window and, and listen outside, I would be hearing these very prairie chickens that you are going to be seeing here and, or are seeing on camera. So Dunn Ranch is located in Hatfield, Missouri. We are roughly a 4,000 acre uh, native prairie here on site. We have about 1,000 acres that is uh, untilled prairie and the rest of it has been pieces that have been restored. Some of these very pieces that we do uh, operate on today uh, was once the homeland of the Southern Sioux and Osage. So want to give a, a shout out to, uh, to that for the land acknowledgement piece. And being here in northern Missouri, the, we are located within the Grand River grassland. Uh, we're talking just under 100,000 acre area that this takes in. And... Uh, Dunn Ranch is a, a, small, a small piece of that, although it's a, a biological gem uh, that sets within the area. TNC owns some ground in that area, as well as MDC. And the prairie chickens is just one of those things that we partner on in protecting. And there's a lot of different things that we do uh, here on our site and some of the surrounding lands and properties, be it in private ownership or public ownership, that is geared towards... Uh, some of the protection of the prairie chicken, but also many of those efforts that we do uh, out on the landscape affect many other forms of wildlife, just as Steve referred to that, uh, you know, from birds and butterflies and insects and all sorts of terrestrial animals. And some of those call this home, you know, uh, 365 days a year. And others uh, use this as migratory stopover. Some of the migratory songbirds that we have come through the site, as well as the monarch migration that takes part in, in these areas. It is a collaborative process and we're, the Nature Conservancy is very fortunate to have MDC as a strong conservation partner that they are not only on this site, but a big driver throughout the state in protecting our, our natural environment and the wildlife and things that are in it. So uh, look forward to diving in on this today and talking a little bit about prairie chickens, but wanted to kind of give you a little bit of context that we're sitting in, 
in northern Missouri here within the great grasslands. Steve, if you would like to kind of kick us off, we'll do a little bit of just some general discussion on prairie chickens themselves, maybe just a little bit of biology and the, the history behind. I know NBC for a long time, they have been doing some, some trapping and reintroductions and bringing them here on site. And if you could kind of fill us in a little bit on the steps that have happened, you know, I've been here a couple of years, I'm an Indiana boy uh, and, and coming in, but I know you, you and NBC have been a, a large part of the effort in this. And for many folks that are tuning in right now, it's, it's fortunate that I, or it's unfortunate that last year and the restrictions that we had with COVID, people weren't able to go out to the prairie chicken blind. And it was at that time that TNC and MDC started talking. We said, hey, you know what? We're going to end up and let's try some live stream camera. And so we were able to bring that out there. And one of the great things I think about this and today that this is really highlighting is, you know, in the, in the past, there has been people that's been able to come and, and register to go to the prairie chicken blinds that have been out there directly on the lek. And, and that would be about a six week window. That'd be about five days a week. It'd be set up to where people could come in that morning and, and check out that blind. Well, as many of you who, who might be on this have tuned in and, and saw it before, or was able to register for that. You came and you got to see it. Well, there's a whole host of people that was not able to come on site and see it. I can, I can tell you that because just I get in here this morning and I have eight phone calls from people asking about, hey, is the blind up this year? So one of the things that we wanted to do is there's people that travel great distance to come or cannot travel. So this is one way in the midst of uh, the environment that we're in that we can bring the prairie to the people. And that's kind of what brought us about on doing this. And I think we're going to see maybe benefits to come where not only everyone can see and appreciate the prairie chickens here on site, but it's also a little bit of a step removed and allowing the chickens to do their thing and not be interrupted in that. So with that, Steve, I'm going to pass it to you to give a little bit of uh, biology and history on the prairie chickens here on site. Absolutely. So it's here on site, but it's also a little bit of a step removed and allowing the chickens to <laughs> so we can't talk about prairie chickens without talking about the prairie. So the Grand River grasslands, as Kent mentioned, is their thing and not be interrupted in that. So with that, Steve, I'm going to pass it to you to give a little bit of uh, biology and history on the prairie chickens here on site. Absolutely. So here on site, but it's also a little bit of a step removed and allowing the chickens to. <laughs> <laughs> Echoing we can't and feedback. I apologize for that. We're not talking about the prairie. So the Grand River grasslands, as Kent mentioned, is... Kent, are you getting that too? <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. Um, let's try again. So the Grand River grasslands is one of the last great opportunities to preserve uh, tall grass prairie within the central United States. It's 92,000 acres in Missouri, but it has a unique position because it's done in collaboration with Iowa. And I see somebody already popped that up in the chat. Um, you, Missouri Department of Conservation, the Nature Conservancy and Iowa DNR have been working in this landscape for 30 years trying to protect prairie, trying to protect prairie chickens. And why are we concerned about prairie? Um, part of the reason that prairie, or we're concerned about prairie and thus we're concerned about prairie chickens is that over the last 200 years, we have lost 99% of prairie, uh, at least in Missouri, and within the central dissected glaciated plains that runs from basically Kansas City to Chicago, this giant landscape that used to be prairie, that used to be chock full of prairie animals, such as bison that you'll find at Dunn Ranch, and such as these prairie chickens that we've lost 99% of. So within this landscape alone, prairie is, is exceedingly rare, and the things that depend on prairie, such as the prairie chicken, um, have followed suit. Now, prairie chickens have kind of a long and storied history as part of Missouri. Uh, we don't have a lot of information about prairie chickens basically pre-European settlement. So if we go back any further than, you know, into the 1700s, we don't really know what our prairie chicken populations looked like at that time. Uh, we know they must have been here. We know they must have been plentiful. Uh, the native cultures that Kent mentioned that uh, inhabited this area, and especially areas further north and west, um, use the prairie chicken as part of their lifestyle. You know, a lot of their dances were, had elements of the prairie chicken dance that we'll see soon. So we know that they were familiar with these creatures and more than likely used them as part of their food source. 
Uh, interestingly, we don't find many prairie chicken remains in a lot of the archaeological sites until you go further north and west again. But um, with European settlement, we started getting more written records of these prairie chickens. We still don't know how many there were in the state. You know, estimates vary, but maybe up to a million prairie chickens used to inhabit uh, just Missouri. And primarily in the north and west parts of Missouri, this is where prairie occurred and this is where the prairie chickens occurred. Um, they are intricately tied to prairie ecosystems. Without prairie, they just don't have a chance of survival. Um, when European settlers arrived, they found these things on these high ridges throughout this landscape. Um, prairie chickens are unique among animals, well, not unique, but have a specialized form of lifestyle uh, where they mate in these systems called lex. And that's where our camera is looking at today. And a lek is a good way to think of it is basically like a dance hall. You know, it's where all the males come and they meet and they show off and they wear their finest clothes. They pump up their air sacs. They put up their pinnated feathers on the back of their heads, um, show off to the other males and basically defend a little territory on the lek. Um, on the off chance a female shows up, the dancing gets a lot more ferocious. Um, they start fighting a little bit. And, um, you know, that's how they prove their, their vigor, their prowess to the females. Other animals do this as well. One of the, interestingly, prairies have a lot of the animals that do this. Prairie mole crickets, which are uh, much smaller and live underground, also for, show a lecking system of mating. And it's thought that this is kind of a feature of the prairie, where you have these vast openings. So by animals queuing in our particular sites, it helps the males and females find each other. Um, and it provides a, a known quantity, an area where they know to go. So prairie chickens in Missouri uh, were actually one of the first species to receive protection by the state. As early as 1851, they were being wiped out in the St. Louis area. Um, they are called prairie chickens. Um, they do, they were heavily used for food stores by early settlers. They were sold in the markets in barrels by the dozen for, you know, a dollar or two. And uh, the market hunting kind of pushed to extinction. So in 1851, it was illegal to harvest them in the St. Louis area. You know, they were still wiped out two years later. By 1874, it was illegal to, or they had a, they had the first statewide hunting on them and that they had an eight month close season. You could only hunt them in this fall months, essentially. Um, still, that was not enough to protect these uh, creatures from the market forces. And by the 18, populations to have peaked in the 1870s or the 1880s that, um, million mark. And since then, it's been a pretty drastic decline. By 1888, they were listed as being, or ornithologists called them, said they were once common, but now rare. So in the course of 10 years, populations really started crashing. By 1907, our population had declined from a million down to about 12,000 individuals throughout the state. And, you know, I say market hunting was a big force in this, but it's also important to realize that prairie the system that these creatures evolved with, where they learned to eat the foods, to survive the weather, to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, was also being destroyed through this point in time. With the invention of the steel board plow, we started losing prairie. With the influx of settlers to this part of the state, you know, in the 1830s to the 1870s, um, prairie went from covering about a third of the state of Missouri to, you know, even by that time, down to 10, 15 percent. So these species had fewer and fewer places to live, and they had the added forces of market hunting going on. So it was really kind of a combination of factors that led them into decline. By the 1980s, well, by 1929, the uh, prairie chickens were thought to be extirpated from Harrison County, where uh, Dunn Ranch is now, where this population is surviving. By the 80s, they were eliminated from majority of North Missouri. The only populations of prairie chickens remaining in the state were in Southwest Missouri. And the Department of Conservation and Nature Conservancy and the Missouri Prairie Foundation started buying properties specifically to support this species, but using this as an umbrella species. So by protecting prairie chickens, which kind of need this communal lifestyle to survive, um, you know, a lone prairie chicken in the landscape is not gonna survive very long, even a pair. Unlike a lot of birds, you know, cardinals, most songbirds that we're familiar with will go out, make a nest, survive in an area for a while. Prairie chickens need more of this lecking lifestyle. So without, you know, large areas, say 10, 20,000 acres worth of grassland, uh, these chickens have a really hard time of surviving. So as we lost our prairie, they were eliminated. By 1999, we were down to a fewer than a thousand chickens in the state of Missouri. And 
a lot of reintroduction efforts had started. Most of our chickens in this landscape actually came from Iowa originally. Um, Iowa started reintroducing prairie chickens before we did back in the late 90s. And uh, a lot of the chickens, I guess, liked Missouri better. I'm not gonna say anything about that Iowa, but um, they started moving down from Iowa to here. And uh, so we had a, a small population hanging on when the Missouri Department of Conservation started augmenting the population with birds from Kansas and Nebraska, trying to get that population back up. We thought we had a landscape that could support these birds. Um, here we are 20 years later, we've now done another round of introductions um, just five years ago, usually dropping off about 100 birds at a time. So the state of prairie chickens in the state today has gone from a million and, you know, our leck count that we did earlier this week, we uh, did 30 birds total in the state of Missouri. So you know, the prairie chickens have had a long, long downhill and, you know, I looks like we're not quite done yet, um, but it looks like there are birds on the lek and we're on the scene, so. Yeah, like, we'll, we'll continue to hear to look on, on screen, but you made a few great comments there, Steve, and, and a little housekeeping thing again, please, if you have any questions, go to that Q&A box, drop that in there, and we'll try to live answer those <laughs> items. Um, as you discussed, Steve, you know, the Nature Conservancy, we've owned Dunn Ranch for a little over 20 years now. And I know prior to that, you all owned property over at, at Pawnee Prairie. And then Chad Pop and his crew uh, up there with the Iowa DNR, they had the Kellerton uh, Fish and Wildlife Area up there on that site. And with that, I do want to take a, uh, a question that I had from Carthage Junior High. And they were asking if the prairie chickens do migrate. And and so what you'll see, and I'll talk in two different contexts within this is, so just the other day when we had our prairie chicken blitz uh, in this area is on Tuesday, uh, that we had about 15 birds that were on this particular lek that, you were view that you're viewing right now. And every single one of those birds walked in to the lek. They did not fly in, they were directly adjacent to the lek and they walked in. Now in the past, I have seen many of those birds fly in from other different locations. So what you can see with the prairie chicken is they can do a sustained flight for upwards of seven miles is what they can do. And they will travel great distances to find food, forage, mating, and things. So some of the same birds that we may experience at different times here on the Dunn Ranch site, like today, you know, there may be a particular bird on this lek that is staying there, but seasonally they do migrate and they may be over on our 600 acre piece of property. They might, you might find a couple individuals over at Pawnee Prairie. And definitely these same birds have some interactions with the birds up at, in Iowa, in Southern Iowa, there at the Kellerton fish and wildlife area. So it's great the interaction that these species have and they travel. So as we do work in, in partnership and not only within the state, but across state borders, I know my role itself within Missouri, I'm 75% working in Missouri, 25% in Southern Iowa within that Grand River grasslands concept. And, it, and it's great that we have this collaboration back and forth because these birds, they don't know no state borders. So they are traveling as they need to uh, across the landscape. Um, I do see another question that has popped up here. It said, do wild turkeys compete with the prairie chickens? Uh, to my knowledge, there is not a competition really with the, the wild turkey per se, but there is a competition uh, with the pheasant. And with the pheasant, the, the, the negative interaction uh, with the pheasant is that, uh, so the prairie chicken, when she goes to lay her her clutch of eggs, she's going to lay between 10 to 15 eggs in that nest. And then what happens is during that time, a pheasant hen is going in and laying some eggs too. Well, you're looking at, I think it's like a 23 to 25 day window gestation period for the prairie chicken. Well, the pheasant's a little bit quicker than that. So what happens is the pheasant eggs hatch and the mama prairie chicken basically heads off with these little chicks and many of them are pheasant chicks. Uh, from times and and that is where it's it's hard enough for the prairie chicken due to numbers just like Steve had alluded to we once had several numbers uh, on site I know last year on this particular lek there was one point in time where we had 30 birds on that lek this year the highest number that I have personally counted has been 15 
uh, on this site. Now, that's not necessarily a negative because we are seeing, as Steve mentioned in the count, you know, we're upwards of 30 birds that was done on the, the blitz. And I think last year may have been 34, 36 birds uh, was on that count. So I think what we're starting to see as, as we do habitat management strategies out there and specifically out on some of these high ridges where they love to lek that we are trying to diversify the habitat provide great heterogeneity and, and I mean that can be in the form of woody removal uh, from encroachment on the prairie which disturbs some of the habitat that they love that open landscape uh, incorporating fire and doing some of those things on sites really help out uh, the chickens and allow them to inhabit and go to different areas on site. So I really think that we're starting to see the population spread and they're gonna start maybe having some smaller leks in certain locations and maybe not so heavily con concentrated on one particular lek. All right, <clears throat> so Kent, we've had a few questions about the number 30 and how kind of scary that is, I guess. Um, so 30 birds is our current estimate, um, you know, is derived by biologists from Missouri, um, NC and Iowa kind of saturating the landscape and driving and looking for as many birds as we can find on a given morning, trying to get as good of a saturation as possible. But yes, 30 is our best estimate of the state. There's probably more out there. We haven't got any of Iowa numbers and they do move back and forth between the two areas pretty readily. Um, so, you know, those are very preliminary numbers, nothing official yet, but the numbers are extremely low. And, you know, a question came about of, of why, why the numbers are so low what happens to these chickens. Well, you know, part of this is that these are reintroduced birds at this point. These birds were all, not these birds, but they're uh, mothers and fathers. So these, um, we stopped reintroductions, what, four years ago now. So these birds are all born in Missouri at this point, more than likely. These, these birds, you know, a number of things would happen. We had some birds that just disappeared off the landscape. We did put video transmitters on a subset of them. And amazingly, one of the birds that we put a transmitter on flew 1,200 miles after we released it. We released it on Dunn Ranch here, and it immediately flew down to St. Joseph. And then it flew, you know, all the way across to Macon County, halfway across the state of Missouri. Nowhere in that period did it see anything it liked better so it turned around and flew back to Dunn Ranch you know a round trip that would take you know us in a car a long time to do this female fried chicken flew um, you know that's like halfway across the country if it no had known where Nebraska was it might have been able to make it back there so just disappear you know they may actually go back to Nebraska we still do get scattered sightings of prairie chickens around the state um, from Atchison County, from other northern counties, and we're never sure if these are done ranch birds or if they're birds that are naturally distinct from Kansas and Nebraska where they still have some um, wild populations remaining. But we know the predation on these birds is pretty high. So Ken mentioned pheasants interfering with their breeding cycle, other meso predators such as skunks, raccoons are responsible for a lot of nest predation. Uh, another hawk will take out some prey chickens and you know even things like barbed wire fence, you'll find prairie chickens decapitated by something as simple as a barbed wire fence. They're just not used to this in their landscape. Um, the settlers did name them prairie chickens because they do, in some respects, act a lot like our domestic fowl. They have a pretty high reproductive rate. They lay, you know, eight to 12 eggs in a batch. And so their strategy is really more to put more chickens on the landscape and see who survives than a long-lived cycle. And hey Ed, I hope you're doing well out there in St. Louis. Um, one of the things I would mention, Steve, is you talked about that one chicken that traveled from location to location. And, you know, initially when there was some of this relocation going on, there was other parts of the state that MDC was very active on, you know, that there was other prairie chickens and, and leks in the area down at Wakanta, uh, MDC, as well as TNC. We own property down there in the Osage Plains. And then we also down around Taborville, uh, there was some, you know, sites and sightings with chickens. And, and one of the things as we, we look at on how they migrate all throughout the state, there's a lot of things. So MDC owns ground, the Nature Conservancy owns some ground, but nested throughout in that whole composition, whether it's from Missouri and Iowa, um, there's a lot of private ownership uh, of ground. And that's one of the things that I know you all have some of your private lands, 
uh, staff that goes out and meets with landowners. I know the Nature Conservancy, myself, and some of our ag and grazing work that we are doing, that we are trying to collaborate and partner with neighbors uh, around us and private landowners to try to incorporate things such as native grasses and doing various strategies out in the landscape. I know where we sit within the Grand River grasslands here, uh, and specifically the area in and around Dunn Ranch, there's, there's a lot of cattle. Uh, that's on this site and it's heavily dominated by uh, fescue, cool season or cool season grasses that are shorter in stature. And although you, although you look at something like this, you're like, all right, they are up on some, you know, short grass and doing their lecking. It is up on a high ridge that when you look at a, a prairie chicken, when you look at a quail, when you look at all sorts of different wildlife, there's a lot of different niches that they need from you know, say nesting habitat through like pulp stages into, you know, the adult phase. And it's a composition of that habitat and, you know, uh, vegetative structure and, and those kind of things that really need to vary across the landscape. And although, you know, maybe MDC's holding and our RN holdings with the diverse species we have, I know Pawnee, Prairie, and Dunn Ranch that you, you're going to see anywhere between 100 and 300 different species of uh, vegetation out there on that site. And it's making sure through utilizing those various measures, like I said, through fire, through land management, uh, you know, utilizing cattle grazing appropriately. You hear at Dunn Ranch, we have bison that graze in those areas and it's creating some of those open pockets, some of those lighter vegetation areas, but having some of those heavy vegetation areas nearby. So as the prairie chickens or quail or anything like that go out their life cycle, they have plenty of areas to not only breed, but also nest, rear their young and forage altogether. So we had a question come in about what makes a lek. And leks are a pretty amazing part of this whole cycle. Um, we think, you know, this called it the dance hall earlier. And it, it is, and an amazing thing about prairie chickens is this fidelity to these sites. These sites are ingrained so deeply in the prairie chicken, not psyche, but you know, in their DNA almost, that when we release the prairie chickens back on this landscape, they return to the exact same spots that uh, Schwartz had documented them in 1945. And even as we find these birds dispersing around the landscape, they're still returning to these same sites. And there's a number of characteristics that make a good lek. And it has to be with elevation. So first, it has to be this high ridge point. So what you want is a view. Um, you want to be able to see predators coming in. Um, you got coyotes coming to your webcam. We might look at that a little later if these birds disperse. Um, you want to be able to see coyotes coming. One, another thing they don't want is hawks. You know, somebody asked about hawks earlier. And prairie chickens really like this treeless landscape. We spend a lot of time, money, and by removing trees and brush from this landscape. Um, because, you know, some, some of our biologists say that, you know, prairie chickens just can't stand a tree. Like if there's, you see those trees in the far landscape, that's about as close as they like to be. Um, if they're in a brushy field or a tree that uh, has trees in it, even if it's an ancestral lek, they won't use that site. The risk of predation is just too high. So they need really wide open vistas. Um, High ridges are important. And then the third component is this low grass that you see here. Um, and this grass is part of their interaction cycle with, with uh, buffalo. So buffalo walls often occurred on these high prairie ridges. And part of this is because these prairie ridges form a hard pan. So they hold water and the bison would wallow there, create these dust bowls for their own purposes. But that would also reduce, you know, all the vegetation in the area. And so when you get that right combination of factors, this is where the prairie chickens historically have tended to choose as their lek sites. Now, if the lek sites aren't maintained, TNC does a fantastic job of maintaining them, the prairie chickens no longer use them. But, you know, it is incredible when these birds even migrate, you know, 300, 150 miles away down towards St. Joe, they still choose the same types of sites. The same sites they chose for, you know, thousands and thousands of years. It's incredible. I know one little tidbit of information as I was kind of looking through things here and preparing for today that I was I was intrigued by and I I was always admired when I come to Dunn Ranch on realizing just how fast uh, a bison can actually run and I thought wow you know they just look like some big cumbersome animals that get out on the landscape but you know they can run you know 40 45 miles an hour well 
in fact, flight for prairie chicken, they can hit upwards of top speeds of near 50 uh, as they go on their sustained flight. And they are able to kind of do a little jump flight and fly uh, short distances when they are about two weeks of age. Uh, so around two weeks that they are really uh, beginning to, to do flight, like Steve said, and I've seen other things on predation and people are talking about uh, ants on here. I'm, I'm not an expert in the world of ants, but I do know that you go out across here, especially when we burn at Dunn Ranch, you are going to see ant hills scattered all across the landscape. And to my knowledge, we have a dip, about 30 different species of ants that are on site. And I am sure that they do play a part in the insect diet uh, of the chickens that are there on site. <laughs> So what you're, what you're seeing on the screen, I know there are some other folks that have made comment about, uh, hey, are they dancing or what are they doing? So what you're going to see is you're going to see a few different individuals kind of scattered out and remaining in a particular area. And so those are the males that are defending that particular site. So each of them are going to have a, a little portion of that lek that they want to call their own. And that's what Steve was referring to as the, the dance hall. So everyone's here on on the stage and they're having a big party and the males, just like any other party, I guess, they're trying to attract the female to them. So uh, the other day when we did have about 15 birds on this lek, there was five of them that were hens. And those hens were kind of just roaming around here or there when it would get closer to one male. You might see a male come over to try to intimidate or push the other male off of his area um, as they try to attract that mate. So it's kind of it's kind of interesting to see that uh, as they come on this lek, there's a lot of different things that go on. And I know we have had before where uh, not just a coyote viewing, but we've had a hawk fly across, actually grab a prairie chicken. We had it on, we had it on camera uh, on the live stream where it actually grabbed the chicken, started to fly off, and the chicken was fighting it and was able to land and, and be fine. But many times when you'll see a hawk come down and they start coming close, the chicken will actually drop on its back and start kicking its legs at the hawk uh, to keep that from happening. So there's a lot of different things. And uh, like I said, that this this thing, this live stream cam is up 24-7 uh, as, as our connections maintain themselves here on site. So you can log into that anytime and, and view uh, the chickens. And there's who no, there's no telling, I guess, what you're going to see when you uh, tune in, tune in on some morning or afternoon, and typically you're going to see the chickens. Uh, they're they're at sunrise uh, before it starts, you know, getting clear enough that you can see. You'll be able to tune in and hear them on the lek. But generally, I would say the bulk of them are going to be on there till 10, 11 o'clock, kind of a thing, and then they might disperse a little bit. But periodically, you're gonna you're gonna see them coming in and off the lek to some extent but the greater time frame is here in these early morning hours. All right, so we've had a few questions about winter survival. Um, so these birds uh, do hang out throughout the winter. Um, they dealt with our negative 17, the same as we did. And there's various strategies they have for this. A lot of uh, gallinaceous birds resort to something called budding, where they'll seek out shrubs, especially when there's snow cover, they'll get up on that snow cover and basically eat the buds off of shrubs and trees to try to get them through the winter. A major these birds use now that historically wasn't available to them is, is row crop, is, you know, fallow, is leftover corn and soybeans in fields, can really help um, get birds through the winter. Uh, in fact, our prairie chicken population probably exploded in Missouri when we started introducing row crop. Um, because it is a high energy food that's not on, hasn't wasn't historically available, and themselves expanded their range greatly to the west and north with um, modern agriculture. So as as we started plowing up the prairie in you know western Nebraska and, and irrigating and things, prairie chickens actually established out there. Historically, they weren't found in that part of the range, and they only moved there with um, the introduction of corn and soybeans. And those are now the parts of the range where the prairie chicken's doing the best. Uh, so, you know, a little bit of agriculture in the landscape that birds really liked. Of course, we passed that point very quickly and they started going back downhill. Um, into spring and summer, they survive on, you know, not only ants, but also grasshoppers are a major food source. Up to a third of their diet, especially when they're raising eggs, is grasshoppers and other prairie invertebrates. Uh, that high protein source is really necessary for successful fledging. And that's 
other question asking about that. You know, all of these birds have, we don't, I don't know offhand a uh, survival rate for the young, but generally for ground nesting birds, it's really low. You know, they lay a lot of eggs. Um, a cold, wet spring can be enough to cause them to fail. Uh, like turkeys and quail, sometimes they can attempt a second nest, but sometimes they'll just give up if their first batch fails. So, you know, they're designed, again, to saturate the landscape with as many birds as possible because, you know, a baby prairie chicken's pretty defenseless to about everything that comes along. One of the things I'd like to do at this time, and I know I know silence puts people uncomfortable, but I can tell you this, in this situation, it does not, and it will not be silent, although Steve and I won't be talking. We're going to give it here, say, three to five minutes. Uh, you know, one of the greatest things I think I have witnessed here on, on Dunn Ranch and just being out in nature in general is – is allowing that time to be still our, our worldly lives. We're in a rat race all the time. We're always, you know, emails, phone calls. There's a lot of noise around us that's very distractive. But there is very, there's something very peaceful about the prairie, about hearing the sounds of it. And I believe the prairie can really speak for itself. And I want you all to have an opportunity here to where Steve and I are not going to talk for a few minutes. And I just want you to listen to the booming of the prairie chickens. Uh, the red winged blackbirds that are doing their cheeping and just kind of find yourself nested within the prairie. And I think you'll gain an appreciation for not only these animals, but conservation in general. And, and I, I would encourage you to join part in what the Nature Conservancy and MDC, as well as our partners up in Iowa are, are doing to not only protect this species, but many forms of wildlife, soil health and water quality uh, throughout the throughout the state of Missouri and the Grand River grasslands. So right now we're going to just take a moment and, and pause here and let you enjoy the sights and sound of the prairie. there's not too many days here on the prairie that it's not windy so you hear a little bit of that a little bit of that sound as well but that's part of the environment that we we operate within uh, I know one of the things here is we continue to watch this if we could end up and we're going to share with you some prairie chicken highlights so we have some highlight reel composed here we want to take a little bit of time and jump over to uh, the the highlights of the prairie chickens <laughs> Kent, there is a question about uh, blinds in future years. Um, I think we would be interested in having again. Obviously, you know, situations are out of our hands right now. Um, I 
this is a, a fantastic way to um, expose people to these birds, you know, these video feeds, and they're generally higher quality than what we're seeing today, I think, as a result of the number of people and running it all through Zoom. But, you know, almost I've gone out and it's been in the blind, and this is almost better in a way because you can get up and get a cup of coffee and you don't have to worry about disturbing the birds. Yeah, and we've had that discussion on what it is, and, and it's a it's a tough balance, to be honest. Uh, we look, and this is the northern, uh, the, the lek that they're on is, is the one that we're reeling the highlight reel on and where the live stream feed is that uh, previously from uh, Dennis and Keith, who are two of the gentlemen that are here on site uh, at Dunn Ranch, and Dennis has been here 20 years, and Keith has been here 14, and they said the, the lek originated really a little bit further to the south in the South Bison unit. And then over time, the birds have kind of came north and, and calling this their main lek. Although the other day when I had about 15 birds here, there was four or five on that South lek still. Um, it's just a balance. It's a, it's a management aspect of wanting people to connect uh, with the chickens, wanting them to see and appreciate the, the spot that they inhabit here on the ferry, but also making sure that we give them their space and making sure that we're removed from that. So many times, if some of you folks have went and had the pleasure of sitting in the blind that, you know, you're getting out, you know, 9, 30, 10 o'clock type of thing, and there are birds still on the lek, um, getting into the blind isn't a big deal. You're getting in under the cover of darkness, you're getting in the blind, but getting out of the blind, there is a disruption uh, to their their breeding rituals or mating rituals. Uh, so, so that is that is a work in progress, on, and that is exactly why we went right now uh, with the constraints that we were under, with uh, you know distancing and number of people that can be in a specific area. That is uh, specifically why that we geared in on the live stream feed to make sure that we can still capture this type of thing. And we're going to be uh, switching this over here in, in probably about another month. Uh, from the prairie chickens to have it overlooking the bison pastures so you might be able to see some baby bison calves but we have two of these cameras on site and uh, we're going to definitely be continuing to use those in a lot of different uh, ways so people as far removed as as St. Louis and some of those areas that are traveling you know three four hours within the state to come here or even those folks that are you know in other states and coming we can make sure to be taking different sights and sounds of the prairie to you. So on this highlight video, you can really see a lot of things pretty well. Um, this male dancing now, you can see his air sacs inflated. Uh, when he deflates those, it produces that kind of, it's called booming to me. It's more of a ghostly sound that really echoes across the prairie. You can hear that from, you know, half a mile, a mile away. You can see those pinnate feathers up. You know, that's an aggressive sign um, when they're interacting with males. Shuffling. Fantastic. And then when they're really displaying for the females is when they, they spread their tail feathers, much like a, a turkey would. They're trying to decide who's bigger right now. Gave up. <laughs> they'll do that all day long. And in fact, they'll be out there in the fall a lot of times doing this as well. In the fall, the females never show up. It's just the males uh, you know, just showing up and showing off trying to establish a pecking order early in the season i guess um so bison are you know an integral part of this system um throughout uh northern throughout north america um i mentioned earlier the bison kind of create these looking these wallows the short grass structure but they also their grazing can serve to create brood brewing habitat you know when those baby prairie chickens run around that aren't the size from a regular baby chicken you know imagine something that size they can't fly trying to navigate the prairie you know if there's a lot of ground litter if there's a lot of duck those baby birds can't get through very well and so the grazing and fire help to remove that duck they really need a lot of bare ground in order to survive it helps them eat it around um so the bison you know helped create all those various stages of of the life cycle that Kent was talking about earlier. You know, it certainly makes the chicken's life easier on these properties. And in other areas, we do use cattle and other various mechanical means to try to replicate the effect that historically had upon prairie chickens because we're operating in a 4,000 acre ecosystem instead of a 40,000 or a 400,000 acre ecosystem. You know, sometimes we have to be a little unnatural to recreate the natural processes. It just isn't practical.
Yeah, Steve, and I think that's a great point. It kind of speaks to what we were talking about before with working with a lot of private landowners. It, it's great that Dunn Ranch is a, a 4,000 acre gem uh, and, and all the MDC ground that sets in this area, you know, those are, those are gems. But, uh, you know, when you go talking 100,000 acre watershed within the Grand River context of the Grand River grassland, uh, a few thousand acres like that is not going to be very sustainable years into the future. And that's why, you know, partnering and trying to leverage uh, different conservation work with not only just yourselves, but with the NRCS and the soil and water districts in the area, fish and wildlife. We have partners with quail and pheasants forever. And, and the partnerships go on and on on how we're wanting to try to get, uh, you know, some more, you know, and it's not like every inch of ground around here needs to look like Dunn Ranch or Pawnee Prairie, but incorporating some pieces of that and some parts of that within the habitats along there can start kind of making this continuous mosaic that would stretch, you know, for several miles to allow these chickens and other species, quite frankly, that ability to move. I did see one on a question on here that I did want to answer. Uh, someone said, well, how can how can see someone see this in person? You know, uh, if you're wanting to see this in person, I, I'm to tell you that, you know, likely from the LEC, it's going to be hard to see that. From the Dunn Ranch office, you may have a spotting scope or binoculars and be able to see that. But what we are looking to do is we are going to here probably within the next three weeks, we are going to start building and it won't be fully ready here for this season, but we'll, it will be in place to enjoy throughout the summer, the fall months, and then be ready for next prairie chicken viewing season in the spring of 2022 there, that we are going to be building an elevated platform here on at the Dunn Ranch office. Uh, we just constructed uh, in our picnic shelter, if you've ever been here, we just uh, built a larger parking area, some handicap accessible parking that's there. Uh, we incorporated a uh, handicap uh, accessible trail that kind of dissects into a piece of the prairie there by the office. And as part of that, we are going to build this large viewing platform and it will be a great location to get a spotting and we're to get a spotting scope, have binoculars, and you're going to be high enough elevation where you're going to be able to look out across there and see the prairie chickens that way as well. So even if we do run ourselves into con constraints to where we can't have the prairie chicken blind out there in person on the luck and doing that, we are trying to, uh, to stack some things together that will get you as close and as interactive with these things as we possibly can. Uh, so we had a question about short-eared owls and it, it ties in well, you know, conservation for prey chickens is, is important and, and then a big focus of all of our organizations. But it, it's also important to realize that when we are conserving for prey chickens, we're attempting at least to conserve for an entire prairie ecosystem. So short-eared owls are certainly part of that system. They do use Dunn Ranch and Pawnee Prairie, other areas in the Grand River grasslands in the winter. Um, at this latitude, they often don't hang out all winter. Once we get a lot of snow on the ground, they tend to take off. Um, we have had short-eared owls and northern harriers nesting in the system. Both of those are pretty rare nesters for the state of Missouri. But, you know, they're all tied into this same system. So as we conserve prairie chicken, we're also attempting to create space for short-eared owls for, you know, everything from eastern meadowlark to Bell's Vireo, red-headed woodpeckers in this system as well. You know, there's a lot of species that, that are dependent upon the same things that just don't be charismatic, right? So we can get... 120 people to show up for a prairie chicken webinar. If we were doing an Eastern Meadowlark webinar, it might not quite be as high. But you know, these are tied together and need similar things. So it is all part of part of the process. And that's a great thing, you know, as we as we as conservationists look at no regret strategies, you know, there's many strategies that we're employing uh, to help the prairie chicken along, but it's also ha helping a whole host of other species out there, let alone the things that you're not seeing, you know, the things that are in the ground, the, the biology that's happening in the ground and making sure that that's right because that in turn impacts water quality. So it's connecting all these pieces together is, is why we're, we're doing some of this. So just to answer some questions quickly, you know, they do hatch out eight to 10 probably chicks a year, um, sometimes up to as high as 17, tend to live two or three years. 
Um, we will, after this, try to send out an email that has uh, answers to the questions we do. A lot coming in and also a lot just going on the video that's good to watch. Um, so there will also be a follow-up email and you can feel free to contact us with further questions we don't get to over the course of this. Female walking in front of that one. That was a good demonstration of that guy's dancing ability right there in the front of the screen, but I don't think she's having any part of it right now. Do you, Steve? No, she doesn't seem very interested. Looking good, though. And just like Steve said, we will continue, and we'll try to answer all the questions that we have. It's hard to get to everything here within a, an hour, but at the uh, end of this, we will be sharing some of our contact information uh, with you all. You can go on to uh, NBC's website and, and learn more about what's going on with the prairie chickens. You can also uh, dive into, uh, for the nature, go to nature.org slash Dunn Ranch Live. So you can go to Dunn Ranch Live and you can check out those chickens each and every day as they're doing this. And you're going to see this type of uh, lecking activity. I would say probably you know, we've had a lot of rain here lately, and as we start warming up in temperatures, I think we'll probably see some more individuals really coming up on there as as, I hope so. as it warms up. I, I think that we'll see some of that, but probably we still have, I would say, a solid month of, of lecking activity that we will likely see here on site. And I know I have seen some clear into, you know, late, late May, early June, even some animals still being up in and around the left, but the largest concentration of them, we're, we're here within that window now and with the next two weeks, we'll probably be near the, the peak of this lecking activity that you'll be seeing. As we approach the end of this, I just want to take a minute to thank you all for coming. Um, you know, this is, in doing this, this is an ancient and irreplaceable part of Missouri's natural heritage, you know, no matter where you're from, this is a part of, of the United States of American heritage. You know, the prairie has virtually disappeared uh, from the continent, from the United States, especially this eastern tall grass prairie. And the species that depend on it, you know, aren't quite as, as visible and charismatic as these guys, but they all need need our help, need your help. And uh, only by, you know, appreciating what's out there can we truly understand what is our prairie and what we're losing if species like this disappear from the state. You know, it is we are down to 30 birds. All of our southwestern prairie prairie chickens, we think, are gone. You know, several years ago, we were down to one, and I haven't heard of any more today. So this is really kind of a major lek for Missouri at this point, um, which is amazing to think about. A bird that once numbered in, you know, up to a million birds throughout the state, and this is and this is what we have. So we appreciate you guys taking time, getting up early to come see us, and uh Experience this. You know, there's other great resources out there. There's the Last Dance, which is a book that just came out about prairie chickens by NBC's photographer. There's the movies about prairie chickens in Missouri, and, and kind of you know, there's a lot more information out there if you want to learn more about this, these species. Yeah, and I would agree, Steve. Well, thank you for for joining in on this uh, live feed this morning, and I know we have some. Uh, ladies that are behind the scene with Christy and Anna that have really helped us out through this process. And I see a few comments on here. Everyone's kind of saying like, great morning, great presentation. Thank you for doing this. I also want to make a note that there are many of you that have tuned in this morning that support conservation efforts, be it through uh, purchases that you make throughout the state, through memberships to the Nature Conservancy, through private donations. The list can go on and on. I, I, I am very hopeful in the fact that you you look at something like this and say, boy, I had a hand in this. I had some kind of hand in protecting this little piece of paradise. And um, by all means, we're going to try to protect and preserve and leverage as much as we can to make sure that future generations can appreciate the same thing that uh, our ancestors uh, and those who uh, walk this ground far before my time on what they did. I, I pray that it's uh, going to be that way for many, many days to come. Absolutely. Uh, 
also of note, if you see prairie chickens anywhere else, please give me a call. <laughs> We're always interested in knowing about more populations. You know, there's still maybe small groups hanging out out there. If you have any information on that, please come. We'd love to know about it. Once again, that's where you can see it each and every day. The Go to nature.org backslash done ranch live and check out that. Uh, you can also go on to the Nature Conservancy's website through Missouri and you can find my contact and email on there as well. If you didn't catch it on one of the previous slides and the same thing goes for, for Steve, you can go to the NDC uh, website and find him. If you have any other questions, feel free to email us. Feel free to give us a call. I know for me, the easiest way to probably catch me is the, the cell phone as we're out and about quite a bit as well. Uh, but we do have office phones where, that you can reach and the email addresses. So uh, we would love to interact with you and answer any questions that we, we can that weren't answered here today. But once again, do thank you all for taking the time, getting up early uh, this morning and, and tuning in and, and seeing, the, seeing the chickens and, and talking a little bit of that this morning. Absolutely. Thank you all for coming out.